skeleton crew today. For those of you watching at home, I hope you're having a great career fair. Or actually, by now it's in the past tense, probably. You didn't want to show off your nice clothes like these guys? No? Oh, well. Any questions about anything? No? OK. Well, let's just keep talking about working with real and complex numbers and wrap that up and then move on into signals, discrete time signals. OK, so anyway, where were we last time? This notation, this blackboard bold F, I'm always going to mean real or complex numbers. And we talked about sequence, what, what it means for a sequence, what a sequence is. And there are possibilities for sequences. A sequence can converge. So it can converge, maybe not. It could be Cauchy, or maybe not. And it turns out that. In the case of R or C, sequence is convergent if and only if it's Cauchy. We saw those, we saw the definition of convergence, the definition of Cauchy, Cauchy last time. Gotta learn to spell here. And also it's easy to prove the conversion implies Cauchy, but proving Cauchy implies convergence, you really can't do that because in a sense the real numbers are rigged so that that works. And then we talked about infinite series. which are just formal expressions to start with, something like that, in the real or the complex numbers. And we talked about what it meant for series to converge, sequence of partial sums, blah, 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 blah. The limit of the sequence of partial sums, if it exists, is called the sum of the series. You can think of a series as an infinite sum, all those kind of things. And at the end of class last time, we talked about bounds, upper and lower bounds. And in this case, we're talking only about sets of real numbers, not sets of complex numbers. So bounds for subsets A of the real numbers. And we talked about every A that's bounded from above has a least upper bound, and we call that the soup of the set A. And every A in the real numbers bounded from below has a greatest lower bound, and we call that the inf of A. And you guys showed your proficiency at just eyeballing various sets of real numbers and telling me what the imps and what the soups were if they existed. And at the very end of class last time, we introduced this notion of max and min, which are kind of like restricted notions of soup and inf. Okay, so given A contained in the real numbers, we say that A has a maximum and it's called max of A when there is some, let's call it A bar in A such that a is less than or equal to A bar for all A's in capital A. And I want to emphasize that A bar, this thing here, is a member of the set A. And we also say that A has a minimum, and it's called min A when there's some a under bar in A, again, it has to be in the set A, such that A is bigger than or equal to A under bar for all A and A. And 
clearly what I'm intending here is that A over bar is max A, and A under bar is min A. And the fact that's important here is that when A has a maximum, that maximum is also its soup. When A has a minimum, that minimum is also its inf. And in fact, A has a maximum if and only if the soup of A is in A. And A has a minimum if and only if the inf of A is in A. So here's a fact. Max A exists if and only if soup A is actually in A. Soup A does not have to be in A. Like if you have an open on the right interval, the soup of that thing is the point just to the right of that open on the right thing. And in which case, soup A and max A are the same. And min A exists if and only if the inf of A is in A, and in which case the inf of A is actually equal to the min of A. And last time I called this Manish's theorem because that's what he proposed, but he's not here. He's a, maybe he's at career fair. Uh, I'm here. Oh, you're here. Oh, okay. So the, we'll still call it Manish's theorem in your honor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. And that's pretty easy to see. I mean, and there's a proof in the monograph, but just think about it. Just think about it. If soup of A is in A, is there anything in A that's bigger than or equal to that? No, because the definition of soup. And so the soup satisfies this definition of max. And similarly for the inf of A when it's in A. Okay, now you could go on and on and talk about lots of other stuff having to do with bounds on sets, greatest upper bound, or least upper bound, greatest lower bound, all that. And there is more of that in the monograph. Things like lim inf and lim soup, min of the max, max of the min, all that. You could read that if you want. We're not going to use it in the class that much at all. It, in fact, not at all. But there's more on this bounding stuff in the monograph. Okay, and the last thing I want to talk about in the context of just working with real and comp, Stefano. So uh, the question is, as I understand it, are do we ever care about upper bounds on bounded sets other than the soup? or lower bounds other than the inf. That's related to Erica's question from last time, actually. You know? And I thought about that you know, last night. I was thinking that I didn't really give you a very good answer to your question. But the way I think of it is this way. Sometimes, sometimes all you care about is determining that a given set is actually bounded from above. right? You don't know that to start with. And you play around, and you actually prove that it is bounded from above, and you experience a sense of relief, whatever. Okay or bound from below. That's one level of caring about upper bounds and lower bounds. And in that case, you don't care how distant the upper bound you find or the lower bound you find is from the set. All you care is that it's there, that it exists. A second level of caring about bounds is you know a set is bounded from above, and you want to get a better idea of how where the soup is. In other words, uh, how tightly can you bound the set? And you can't figure out the soup. That's hard in general for, for arbitrary sets. But you can, by various mathematical machinations or whatever, get better and better approximations to it. And sometimes in engineering context, those are the only things you have. You don't have a grip on the actual soup or the actual int. You happen to know a set is bounded from above. You know a bunch of upper bounds. And people publish papers and journals and say, we have improved are you know, the upper bound to, to so-and-so. We have lowered the upper bound that we know to this. And that, that's how people, that's how science advances, so to speak. You know? and, 
And the people who prove the big theorems are the ones who actually find the theoretical limits, which are the soups and the imps. But bottom line is that you, you often care about bounds only in the, in the sense that they exist or not. And sometimes you're, you have a hard time getting to the tightest bounds, but you're, you know, every, every bit of progress is important. Okay, so that's a lengthy speech that I think, I don't know, in a long-winded fashion covers both your question and stuff. No, anyway. So is that, is that good? Is that fair? Okay. All right, so you can, you can look in the monograph for more on this bounded type stuff. The last thing I want to talk about <clears throat> in the context of just working with real and complex number, numbers is this idea of monotone sequences because those come up an awful lot. Actually, the se it's only the second to last thing. There's one more thing. So two more items. So here's a, here's, here's a fact about sequences of real numbers. If CN is a sequence of a real numbers, and CN is what we call monotonically increasing, that is to say CN plus 1 is bigger than or equal to CN for all n. And bounded from above, all I mean by that is that the set of all numbers in the sequence, if you think of that as an A, that has an upper bound. So I can say, that is to say, there exists, say, V double, or V bar in the reals, such that CN is less than or equal to V bar for all N. So if that's a sequence, if, it's, if you have a sequence that's monotonically increasing and bounded from above, then CN converges. And can you guess what it converges to? Let's see if someone else wants to. I'll let you go if, after three seconds. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. Nathan. OK, there is a V bar such that CN is less than V bar, but maybe that's 10 to the 59. OK. Uh, Wait, I'm trying to remember. Zach, is that right? Zach, uh, soup. the soup of what? Um, uh, the yeah, if you think of the CNs as being a discrete set of real numbers, an A, and that's what you were going to say, I'm sure, I'm sure you're going to say that, <laughs> then that's what it converges to. So in fact, limit as n goes to infinity of CN is equal to the soup of the set consisting of all CN such that N is in the natural numbers. So you think of this set of numbers, the set of numbers constituting a sequence as being a set, an A, so to speak. The soup of that A is the limit of this monotonically increasing sequence. And you, you can imagine there's a, a bounded from below version of this fact. So there's an obvious version of this fact so for CN bounded from below and monotonically decreasing and that also holds So what's the limb as n goes to infinity of a monotonically decreasing sequence that's bounded from below? It's going to be the nth of the set of numbers in the sequence.
Now, why do you think this is useful? Well, it turns out you can turn a lot of questions about sequences into questions about monotonic sequences. And anytime you can, you can do that, it's to your advantage. And there's a proof of this in the monograph. I'm not going to do it in class. And the very last thing that I want to mention about just real and complex numbers and stuff like that in general is the following result. And, and this, this may seem a little strange, just popping up out of nowhere, but it turns out it's really useful when you're trying to say, show that a system is stable, blah, 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 blah. You, wanna, you end up using this kind of a thing. OK. So one final item. So here's some terminology. You're given a sequence Cn in F. So now we're back to talking about both the reals and the complexes. We say that Cn is summable when the infinite series you get by putting the CNs as the terms of the infinite series converges. That's what it means for a sequence to be summable. When the series you get, when you use the sequence things as the elements of the series, converges. And by the way, you can do this also for two-sided sequences. I'll, I'll comment on that afterward. We say Cn is absolutely summable when, guess what, the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of the absolute value or magnitude, depending on whether you're talking real or complex, converges. OK, so that's summable versus absolutely summable. Now, if you have a summable sequence, is it necessarily absolutely summable? Can you think of an example of a summable sequence that's not absolutely summable? We actually talked about it, I think, last time, briefly. Aiden. Yeah, yeah, the, the harmonic series, quote unquote, the sequence whose terms constitute the harmonic series, the alternating harmonic series, is summable, but not absolutely summable. So, turns out that summable doesn't imply absolutely summable. Example, how about Cn is equal to um, minus 1 to the n over n plus 1? That's, that's a way of writing the sequence you're talking about here. So what does the sequence look like? It looks like 1, 1 half with a minus sign, positive 1 third, minus 1 fourth, positive 1 fifth, and so on. It turns out 
that that sequence is summable and it sums to the natural log of 2. Okay? So this sequence is summable. And in fact, the sum over all n of the cn is the natural log of 2, but not absolutely summable. And that's because, as everybody knows, the harmonic series is not absolutely summable by that integral argument that we did on the private board last time. OK, so question, does absolutely summable imply summable? How many people think yes? How many people think no? Not necessarily. Well, it turns out, yes. And, and it turns out that, <laughs> that, that that is by virtue of every Cauchy sequence has a limit. And this is important. So here's a fact. fact, if Cn is a sequence in the reals or the complexes, that's absolutely summable. Then Cn is also plain old summable. And there's a proof of that in the monograph. And it's pretty easy to show. What you do is you show that if Cn is absolutely summable, then, then the sequence of partial sums of Cn is a Cauchy sequence. And you, know, you can read through that. It's not the kind of thing that's really worth going over on the board. OK? So there's an easy proof. It's not hard. In the monograph. Now, why might you ever want to use this? Like I said, it turns out sometimes you have a situation where you have, it's easier to show that, that you have absolute summability than that you have summability. But from that, you can conclude summability. And I'll try to give you a couple problems on the homework that illustrate that situation. OK, so that's all I want to do uh, in general about working with real or complex numbers before we move on and start talking about, oh, uh, by the way, I said two-sided versions of this stuff hold. So note these last results or let's say this last result that you have an absolute summability implies summability also holds for two-sided sequences. So those are sequences indexed by all the integers, not just the non-negative integers. OK, so that's about it. That's all I want to talk about in terms of generalities, about working with real and complex numbers. There's lots more you could do. If you want to probe the stuff more deeply at Cornell, there's a really good course, Math 4130, called Intro Real Analysis, and a lot of our Top students have taken that class in the past. And depending on who's teaching it, it can be really awesome. OK, I've heard horror stories about some versions of it and sort of rhapsodic um, soliloquies about others. So you know, ask around. Alex. Um, question, what exactly is the definition of monotonicity? Monotonicity is, is, is one, one unidirectional change, OK? So like, uh, for example, you know, if you have one of those illnesses where you have good days and bad days, and you're not getting monotonically better, that's, that's, a, way, that's a way of using it, right? Um, anything that's, like, you, we, we're using it in terms of size. Like, the CNs, 
ever going upward or ever going downward, that means they're monotonically increasing or decreasing respectively. So if you parse the Latin, mono would obviously be one, and tonic would be like, uh, like tone, I don't know. Like, yeah, so that's, that's definition. Unidirectional change. Any other questions about this general stuff before we move on to? Any questions from our audience at home? A rather large audience at home today. Anybody want to reach out to a friend? No. What, what? <laughs> okay. All right. So, so end of little segment, and let's move on to our next kind of big quote unquote topic area, and that's discrete time signals and stuff you can do to them. Or with them. It's, to them sounds like you're hurting the signals in some sense. You know. What can you do to discrete time signals? Anyway, so the next, next topics. Discrete time signals and what you can do with them. All right, so what, what's the starting point here? We want to talk about discrete time signals. So first, let's discuss what discrete time is. Okay. We think of the integers z as a model for discrete time. And when you're thinking about discrete time signals, they don't have to be sample continuous time signals. They, they could just be sequences of numbers that you find lying around somewhere, or that someone on Hope Plaza gives you, with no apparent relation between the index of the sequence and any kind of a truly temporal variable. They could be grayscale levels of an image that's one dimensional, you know, whatever. Okay. But in any event, we think of the integers as a model for discrete time, and we think of say some number n0 in the integers as quote unquote time n0. And this is going to be true even when the variable doesn't really correspond to anything temporal in the real world. So note that despite our repeated use of the T word, the integer variable integer variable might not be rigidly temporal. For example, maybe spatial, whatever. Okay. But anyway, discrete time signals, we're gonna we're gonna be talking about the integer variable as if it were time. We're always gonna be saying a time in zero, whatever. Okay, so what's a discrete time signal? It's going to be a real or complex function of discrete time. And how are we going to set that up? We're going to set it up. We're going to use our notation. We're going to use our mapping notation. So here's a definition. A discrete time signal is 
is a mapping and the typical notation for discrete time signal is going to be an unsubscripted Roman letter so X is going to be the classic from Z into F where F is equal to R or C and if it's R we say it's a real valued signal if it's C it's a complex valued signal and so on that's what a signal is and one habit of notation and thought we're going to try to develop this semester that we didn't use in EC 2200 and I don't think even those of you who took 2200 from somebody else probably you talked about things like this given a discrete time signal X of n does that sound familiar does that feel familiar we're not going to talk that way we're going to talk about the discrete time signal as just the letter X and we're never going to say x of n unless we're talking about its value at a specific time n. And at the moment, that might seem like overly pedantic, OCD, whatever, but it's not. It's really important. Okay, so here, so x, that notation is the whole signal. And for any n in z, x of n is the value of that signal at time n. Okay? So we're never going to say, quote unquote, the signal x of n. I'm going to write that over here in quotes, and then I'm going to put this around it and that through it. Okay, so that's not, that's not how we're going to talk, okay? This is so last year, all right? Fair enough, Ricardo? But when we use x of n, we use the square brackets or...? No, we're not going to use any square brackets in this, so in this course. No, but we will use x of n. Question, I... Uh, oh, okay, so, this, so the discrete nature of it is implied. We don't need to have the distinction between square brackets. We won't, yeah, yeah. We won't, we won't be doing the square bracket and the round bracket thing. That is, <laughs> that, like I said last year, that's an invention of, of those guys, like Oppenheim and, and uh, Schaefer and McClellan and, and all those people. And it's good for some things, but we're, we're not going to use that this semester. Okay, so that's what a discrete time signal is. Now, if you're given a discrete time signal, x, in order to describe it, you have to tell what its value is at every n in the integers. And so, quite often, we're going to see this kind of a thing. So here's a, a typical kind of thing we'll see. And here, I'm, I'm, help, I'm trying to help you get used to the language, the rhythm of how we talk about things. Quote, unquote, the signal x with specification x of n is equal to 3 to the minus n for all n in the integers. What does that replace? That replaces text in the elementary book that says, quote, the signal x of n equals 3 to the minus n. And you say, well, what, what, you know, aren't we supposed to be like making things more compact, more succinct, all that stuff? Yes and no. I think you'll understand as we go along why we're, we'll be careful about this. All right, so before we... <coughs> <coughs> Before we talk about these things in general, I want to establish some notation for two special signals that we'll be using again and again and again throughout the semester. Can anybody guess what they are? Well, yep, the impulse, and what's the other one? Step, step, step. step, yeah. Okay, so some important signals. And there's actually one that's even more elementary than either of those. Yes. Was that Balazs or? No. 
David, OK. Some important signal signals. OK, first of all, the zero signal And that's the x. That's the signal x with specification x of n equals 0 for all n. That's one important signal that we see again and again. Another one is the discrete time unit impulse. And that's the signal delta. with specification delta of n equals 1 when n equals 0 and 0 otherwise. And of course, n is only running over integer variables here. And finally, the discrete time unit step That's the signal u, and we're always going to be using delta to denote the discrete time impulse, and u to denote the discrete time unit step, and also in continuous time, but anyway. Um, that's the signal u with specification u of n equals 1 when n is bigger than or equal to 0 and 0 when n is less than 0. OK, so those are friends. 0, delta, and u. We're going to see those again and again. And again, the signal is delta. Its value at any time n is delta of n. Same with u. OK, here's some notation. And this notation is actually, it is a version of a mathematically correct or sophisticated way of describing these things. In this context, f to the z, OK, this is the set of all discrete time set. OK, so quite frequently I'll be saying for all x and f to the z, such and such a result holds or whatever. That's the set of all discrete time signals. Now the cool thing is, or a cool thing about f to the z is it has a significant amount of structure on it. There's stuff that you can do to discrete time signals. And if you think of f to the z as a big set, you can think of it as having operations defined on it. OK, so what are some things you can do? With discrete time signals.
Multiply by zero, yeah. That's a special case of the, what I'm going to do next, yeah. Anybody else have an idea of stuff you could do with, say, what are some things you can do with two discrete time signals? If someone comes up to you in whole plaza and gives you two discrete time signals, J. Could you, you could add them, exactly. Or you could multiply them by zero or by seven or whatever. And, and putting those two together, you get a more general notion, the notion of Linear combinations, perfect. Okay, th th this is this is great. This is like I, I'll pay you later. Okay, <laughs> for no, we did not prearrange that. So as a set of signals, f to the z has some nice structure. There's stuff you can do to signals in f to the z. So given x1 and x2 in f to the z, and c1 and c2 in f, so those are numbers, okay, we can define, we can construct the signal x equals c1 x1 plus c2 x2 in a pointwise fashion. What do, I mean, what do I mean by that? This x has specification. x of n is equal to c1 x1 of n plus c2 x2 of n for all n. And this is called a linear combination of x1 and x2 with coefficients c1 and c2. Ricardo said one thing you could do with signals was multiply by 0. That would be like taking x1 and having c1 be 0 and not even having an x2. And Jay said adding, that would be having c1 and c2 equal to 1 and just x1 plus x2 of n for every n. This is the notion of linear combination. And more generally, if you have a bunch of signals, you could take a linear combination of all of them. So, or more generally, given, say, x1 up through xk in f to the z, and c1 up through ck, in F, we can form uh, x equals c1 x1 plus c2 x2 plus ck xk. x has specification x of n equals c1 x1 of n plus c2 x2 of n up through ck xk of n for all n. OK, so this is the notion of taking linear combinations of signals. So way of stating that is that on f to the z, we have the notion of taking linear combos All right now what do we call a set on which we have a notion of taking linear combos What algebraic structure does such a set have I'm testing your What's that? Okay. No, well, yeah, I mean, uh, no, <laughs> actually. Okay, th th think math 2940, linear algebra. 
Well, this is a this is a linear thing we're doing. What 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 is the name for a set on which you have like linear operations defined? A vector space. That's what I was looking for. I don't. Who said it first? Okay. What's your name? Did I used to know your name and forgot it? That's terrible. Oh, that's terrible. I apologize. When you, as soon as you said Tim, I, I knew your voice immediately, and I thought, oh my God, I know this guy. I forgot his name. Oh, that's terrible. Okay. Any set of objects on which you have a notion of taking linear combinations that does the right thing with respect to zero, say, for example, is a vector space. And I'm not going to go and, and write up all the vector space axioms on the board or anything like that. If, if, by the way, there are a couple chapters in the book, in the monograph, on linear algebra. And as I told you the first day of school, if you weren't here, I'm not going to cover that stuff in class, but if you want to do a quick and dirty review of your linear algebra, you can read those chapters, and I think it might help. So technically, what, I'm, what I mean here is f to the z has the structure of a vector space over the field f. In other words, you have a way of taking linear combinations of things with coefficients from f that behaves correctly with respect to 0. And when I say behaves correctly with respect to 0, I mean that in f to the z we have a 0 vector. What is the 0 vector in f to the z? Anybody want to hazard a guess? The zero signal, yes. And behaving correctly with respect to zero means that if I take the scalar zero, so this is the number, times a signal x, I get the signal zero. for all x in f to the z. And I remember my high school pre-calc teacher when he was teaching us about vector spaces, he, he tried to distinguish between zero vector and zero scalar by putting a face in the, in the zero vector. But it got so that he would never say zero, he would say face. And so it always sounded with, you know, like zero times x equals face, you know. I don't know. It just didn't. Anyway, does that, does that make that little sentence there at the bottom make sense to everybody? OK. And vector spaces have subspaces. And as we go along, we're going to encounter some of these important subspaces, things like right-sided, left-sided signals, finite duration signals, and so on. OK, so that's one thing. f to the z has a vector space structure. Now another operation on f to the z that we're going to see repeatedly over the course of the semester is I'm not going to have time to do this. It's, it's going to be time shifting. Okay? And we're going to see that a lot. And we're also going to talk about subspaces of f to the z closed under time shifting. We'll get to that next time. What's that?